Good evening, and welcome to those of you gathered here in person in the Duke Family Performance Hall, and those joining from all over the world on our live stream for our Nisbet Lecture featuring Ania Williams, systempreneur, creator, inventor, tech change maker, investor, and opera singer. The Nisbet Lecture was established in 2014 through the generous support from Marian Nisbet and Chip Nisbet, Davidson class of 1986. I'm Liz Brigham, the W. Spencer Mitchum Director for Innovation and Entrepreneurship at the J. Hurt Hub for Innovation and Entrepreneurship at Davidson College. Tonight's discussion is a cornerstone event for the Hurt Hub at Davidson as we facilitate access and exposure to innovation and entrepreneurship for all. We serve the Davidson College campus and our innovator and entrepreneur community here in Greater Charlotte and globally. We believe that innovation is born out of freedom, integrity, and inclusion. The freedom to take risks, the freedom to fail and to succeed. Integrity is our expectation. Inclusion is the foundation of everything we do. And we live our mission through five areas at the Hurt Hub. Educational programming, high impact experiential learning opportunities like our Gig Hub program, mentorship, access to capital, and an inspirational co-working space. And as we like to say, we're the place where purposeful serendipity happens. To learn more about the Hurt Hub at Davidson, please visit our website, www.hurthub.davidson.edu, and sign up for our newsletter. But before we begin our program, I would also really like to thank the village that made tonight possible including the Hurt Hub at Davidson leadership team, our student community events ambassadors, college relations and special events, college communications, and of course the backstage crew here tonight. For tonight's program, Ania Williams will share her journey from opera singer to entrepreneur and investor, and how we can turn our most valuable skills into profitable businesses while staying true to who we are. After Ania shares her story, we will welcome Carson Crochet, Davidson senior, German and Arab studies major, and CEO and founder of Kabuddy, a care package company to support those undergoing cancer treatments. And she will interview Ania in a fireside chat between entrepreneurs. Allow me to introduce Ania Williams. Ania is a systempreneur, creator, inventor, tech change maker, and investor. She is a principal at the res uh, uh, excuse me. She is a principal on the responsible technology team at the Omidyar Network, and works to help the tech world live up to its promise of changing lives for the better. Ania founded Black and Brown Founders, a nonprofit which helps Black and Latinx entrepreneurs launch tech businesses. She continues to serve as that organization's board chair. She's also the co-founder of Zebras Unite, an entrepreneur-led movement focused on creating a more ethical and sustainable startup ecosystem through capital, culture, and community. Before becoming an entrepreneur, Ania held roles in marketing, business development, and nonprofit fundraising. And she also has a background in the arts with over a decade of training as an opera singer. Please join me in welcoming Ania Williams to the stage. Thank you, Liz. Good evening, everyone. Really excited to be here this evening. I am Ania Williams, in case you missed the slide and Liz's remarks. And um, as she mentioned, in a former life, I was an opera singer. Uh, but I went on to start a fashion tech hardware company, and after that, three other organizations to help underestimated founders become entrepreneurs, well, people become founders, um, and start tech businesses. I also manage a multi-million dollar portfolio of organizations who are trying to build a more equitable and inclusive world. 
So how do you get from music major, opera singer, to innovation, entrepreneurship, and investment? Well, the path hasn't exactly been linear, but it does make sense when you think about it because I'm a problem solver. And every time, I've set out to solve problems in the ways that I knew how, by focusing on what I have in spades and not what I'm missing. I turned my most valuable skills, insights, and connections into money-making companies. And you don't have to have an MBA to start or to run a business. There's no degree, no permit, no exams required, and you can start as soon as today. In fact, one of the most powerful things about entrepreneurship is that anyone with a valuable solution to a problem and the courage to try and solve it can try their hand at it. You know, the bright spot to the madness that is our world today is that there are a lot of problems that need to be solved. And every problem is an opportunity, which means that there is no lack of opportunities to start building a company. But how, you ask? Well, I dubbed this talk, How to Launch a Startup, so we're gonna get into that. Uh, and we're gonna approach this uh, from an assumption that if you're doing this the scrap, like doing this the scrappy way, and working with modest resources, we're gonna break this into three parts. I'm gonna kind of give you a quick sort of uh, playbook, if you will, and then we can kind of get into some more details when I get to sit down with Carson. So part one, gather people and gather info. Part two, prototype and monetize. Part three, listen and iterate. Okay, so part one, gather people and gather info. Honestly, the biggest barrier to starting a company is you. Your mindset, your confidence, and knowing what you want is the place to start. You're gonna do best when you have a high-level vision of what you're trying to achieve personally, especially because entrepreneurship is unforgiving and thankless at this stage. And if you're trying to put yourself through the gauntlet <laughs> that is gonna be your everyday life, the highs and the lows and all of it, it should be serving your life goals. So I usually tell people to start here with these kinds of questions. Who are you trying to be? Where are you trying to go? And what does an ideal day look like when your business is successful? Then break that down and reverse engineer it. So ask yourself, what are the things that are required to make that happen? So let's just say that your ideal day is one where you're not working at all. And maybe you wake up on the island of Hawaii with birds on your windowsill and having a lovely breakfast. And maybe you don't have your first meeting until 2 p.m. Then you can go back and you can think about what are the things that are required to make that happen. If my business is running because I'm taking my leisurely breakfast, I need XYZ people working for me. I need to be able to make enough money to have my apartment in Hawaii. I need to be able to think about who's gonna be watching my kids if you have kids so I can have this peaceful breakfast. And all of that just becomes these things that you can actually even assign a value to and think about and start to target, okay. To get all of these things, I need to be paying myself this much, I need to pay my workers this much, and I need to have a business that makes this much money, right? Um, got the beginnings of a business plan right there. Now, if you're starting a company, first and foremost, as I mentioned before, you have to be trying to solve a problem. And more importantly, you should be solving a problem for a community that you're from or have meaningful access to. This is really important, and here's why. One, if you're trying to solve a problem for people that you don't know or deeply understand their mindset, you're very unlikely to come up with the most effective solution. Number two is because you're eventually going to need to find people to sell your solution to, and having access to a community from day one means you've already got early adopters. A lot of founders fall prey to magical thinking by looking at market opportunities first and give that more weight than the folks that they actually know. This is a trap, especially if you are building while broke. You can't afford to throw spaghetti at the wall and see what sticks. You have to really come armed with lots of information about the problem that you're trying to solve and what people need. So here are some things that I recommend you deeply understand. About the communities that you're connected to, what problems do people have that you want to address? Where, when, and how do they experience pain or frustration around that problem? And how do they understand it? How do they talk about it? What are they doing right now to fix that problem? 
Remember that you're trying to do a lot with a little, and one of the best ways you can do that is to have the answers to these questions, and then couple that with your core skills and what you bring to the table. So understanding your core skill set by kind of taking an inventory of your skills and your passion, you're gonna need to be building on the foundation of your greatest strengths. So start your business on top of the things that you do well, not only what you wish you could be doing. You want to identify knowledge that's unique to you and then build on that, something that's easy for you, something that draws on what you already know, something that might be hard for other people, but you can do it in your sleep. They say that the best innovations marry two things from very two different worlds. And I think everyone here at Davidson College is already at an advantage with your different kinds of backgrounds, bringing that into new areas and new sectors and applying that knowledge in ways that people in that industry have not before could be the thing that sets you apart and makes your business special, it makes the thing that people keep coming back to you for. Um, one of the things I like to say is they can have the recipe, but the sauce won't take the same. Um, this is where you want to flex what you uniquely bring to things, right? It's going to be your competitive advantage. So gathering info and gathering people is about deciding your end goal so you can build a business that you actually want to be running in 5, 10, 20, or 50 years later. Digging deep to think about what special perspectives, experiences, knowledge, or skills that you bring to the table gaining deep insight about the problem that you're solving so you can address it effectively, and having an initial audience to sell to and not getting buried in the noise when you market your thing later. Okay, so part two, prototype and monetize. So next you're gonna want to make a prediction about what your potential solution can do to solve your customer's problem. And then you wanna test that with a prototype or what we call in startups a, a minimum viable product, which typically is just, you know, what is the basic bare bones thing that you need that you can start to sell and start to make money from today? Because again, if you're building while broke, you're gonna need to get to revenue as quickly as possible, right? This is like, what if you never saw a dollar of investment money? How would you get from zero to one? It doesn't have to be super slick doesn't have to be super fancy, it just needs to give the results that you promised to your customer. That's it. And until you've gotten to what we call product market fit, your job is to answer these three questions, which I got from Tara Reed, who uh, owns Apps Without Code, and I love these three questions, because this is your job until you do find product market fit. One, does anyone want this? Two, will they pay you money for it? And three, why are they paying you money? Like, what are the core benefits? What are the features that are important that are getting them to pay you the money? So don't get trapped by trying to build the most perfect thing. Just deliver on your promises. The key here is to understand the many ways that you can address the problem. What are the solutions to the problem that exist today and what's missing? And then you can even map it out from there. You can identify the place where the problem your strengths and some poor or non-existent current solution meet. And then you start building. And the most basic thing that you wanna build is testing your most important assumptions. So think about this kind of fashion tech company that I launched, right? We made a necklace that transforms into headphones. My assumption was that fashionable women would prefer to have their electronics look like the accessories that they already wear. Think of it as an if-then statement. If I build headphones that look like a necklace, then fashionable women would buy that instead of regular headphones because they want to love everything they wear. Now, about monetization. I know that this can get into a little bit of scary territory for folks because at some point, you're gonna have to ask people to pay you money. And I know that that can be a scary proposition, but Businesses exist to make money, so if you're not planning to at least make enough money to sustain your operations, goodbye, do not pass go, do not collect $200. You do not have a business, you have a very, very expensive hobby. And you will need to know what it is that people are willing to pay for. So what can you sell that makes the numbers work? Remember that ideal day that we just imagined and you broke that down into some numbers of what that's gonna cost? Let's say that that's your business target, right? That's your revenue goal. Work it backward. 
If you want to make half a million dollars a year, 500K, and your product or your service costs $50, that means you need to sell 10,000 widgets. It's a lot of widgets. I mean, that's also assuming that every person that you encounter buys that thing. You're probably going to need to at least 10x that just to convert 10% of those people. So really thinking about, OK, can I get in front of 100,000 people so I can sell 10,000 widgets, right? You can also slice that from another angle, which is thinking about what high value services you can offer. So if you want to gross, again, 500K a year, and your product or service maybe is a bit more hands-on, and it costs $10,000 for a year, you only need to sell 50. So if you're sure that people want this, and you've figured out what's important to them, then you're going to quickly find out if they will pay you money for it. And there is no greater validation than a happy paying customer. So make sure you have enough of them. And this is also where that community comes in. It's important to tee up people who are ready to have their prayers answered by what you've created. And I'm not talking about your friends and not your family, because you need people you're connected to who will pay full price for your product. <laughs> and not live their lives half price. Um, so monetize that offering by either asking those folks to pay for your service directly, or if you're still trying to build up the product and really get it to the right place, you've got a great story, you've got some inklings of things that you can really motivate and tell a good story around, crowdfund from them. That brings us to part three. Listen and iterate and pivot if needed. Uh, so when you create your MVP, your, your minimum viable product or your prototype, you want to build uh, in feedback loops. And you want to listen to what people are telling you. And a lot of people, even people who build the most visible startups that you see today, sometimes overlook this part. For every major assumption or key feature that you are putting into your product, which I hope is as few as possible when you're just getting started, because you do really want to isolate the variables to something that you can control and watch, then you need to have a way to collect data about whether it's working as you expected it to. So strong feedback loops are essential. And you'll never know if and why you actually got to product market fit if you don't actually have some mechanisms designed in there to track it. So at a minimum, you can frame your feedback loops around the three questions I mentioned earlier. Does anyone want this? Will they pay you money for it? And why are they paying you money? Based off of what you learn, you can keep iterating and improving your offering to make it more effective at delivering on its promise to its customer, to your customers. And once your thing is built and out there, it's going to be a constant cycle of iteration. The iterating never ends. Maybe even a pivot or two as you learn some big kind of uh, realizations that you might want to completely shift the focus of the product to meet the market where they want to be. And then you can hone in on the best way to address a critical need. So just keep making your customers happy, keep creating value, and then keep that money flowing. Happiness is actually not having it all. It is letting go of what you don't need. So get rid of the stuff that's not working and double down on what does. So to recap, those three things. You want to gather people and gather info, prototype and monetize, listen and iterate. And, um, I got a couple other few pro tips I want to throw in there too. One, don't boil the ocean. I think it can be really tempting to say, I am going to build a food blog and it's going to make lots of money off of advertising, right? Um, one, that puts you in the trap of having to have a lot, a lot of eyeballs to turn a profit, right? Because those are very, very, very small transactions that have to add up to something really big. Um, and also, you have to be even more specific than that. There's lots of food blogs out there. So it can't be just a food blog or just a paleo food blog. It has to be like a paleo food blog for moms who are trying to diet after they lost or after they had a baby. Uh, like you really want to get into something really specific because you want your customers in the early days to feel like they designed this for me. They had this with me in mind. And again, you want to isolate those variables down so you can know what's working and what's not working. I would also say, don't do it alone. And again, if you're building while broke, you might not have money to like build up a team and pay salaries or get the top engineers to leave their jobs at Google to come work with you. But there are lots of really interesting and creative ways that you can build teams around you. When I was building while broke, I leaned on a lot of great relationships that I had with people who could show up and help me with a thing. 
Sometimes we bartered where maybe I would help them with some of their marketing, they would help me with something that I needed. Um, sometimes they would become advisors. They would keep their job at Google, but they agreed to give me five hours of their time a month and I was getting top-notch experience and advice on some of the problems that I was trying to solve. Think outside of the box, right? These are all relationships and really business runs on relationships. And then the third thing I would say is to always be learning and that failure is always an option. Obviously not the goal, but I always learn most from my failures, way more than I learn from the things that go well. Um, and if you're not learning, then you're not gonna be iterating, you're not gonna be improving, your product's not gonna get better. So, that's the playbook. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ania, that was wonderful. Oh, and thank you for everyone for sticking around and you as well for this fireside chat. Um, I definitely could have benefited from hearing that about six months ago. Yeah. <laughs> Certainly. Best laid plans. Mm -hmm. As Liz mentioned, I'm an entrepreneur, but I'm also a student here at Davidson. My name is Carson Kirschay. I am a current senior, double majoring in German studies and Arab studies. My company is titled Kabuddy. It is a care package company that provides plush naked mole rats to cancer patients. And if that intrigues you enough, I encourage you to go to cabuddyclub.org to find more. But back to you, Nia. I have some questions for you. Let's get into it. Of course. You mentioned at the very beginning that you can create a business the scrappy way. And as someone who is not majoring in business or econ, um, I'm wondering if you can expand on that a little more, especially how you find that path. Yeah, I would say that a lot of people tend to think that you need a ton of money or you need to have a bunch of investors to try to get something off the ground. And I hope that I was able to touch on some of them in my talk, but really it's to think about, one, being armed with as much information as possible. That is the thing that's going to save you a lot of money and time. I think that you are going to eventually have to just put in more hours, put in more elbow grease to kind of compensate for some of the things that you might have typically been able to just purchase or hire um, to solve, but you can also avoid some of the traps and the problems by coming as a very informed individual to the problem that you're trying to solve. So I always go back to, again, solving a problem for a community that you're from or have access to is going to shortcut a few of those things. Got it. Um, so then when it comes to finding that education or those resources that you may not have or be surrounded by, where would you point students or any person that's looking for a career switch to go and to look for those things? Yeah, I would say resources are all over the internet, not all of them good. Um, so really, I would say to really start with people that you can talk to and pick their brain about what it is that you're trying to figure out. And in fact, um, when I started uh, Tinsel, the necklace headphones company, I knew that I really wanted this thing. Like I wanted jewelry that could do more than be jewelry. Um, and I knew that it was gonna require manufacturing. I knew it was gonna require visual design in a way that I did not have the skills to bring it together. And um, where I started was by talking and asking people a lot of questions, right? Like I remember the the very first person who I went and talked to was a friend of mine who was a graphic designer and I asked him if he could help with helping me take the idea of something that I had in my head to something I could show people. And he was like, oh, that sounds amazing, but I'm like not that kind of designer. You need like an industrial designer. And I was just like, oh, I didn't even know that that was a thing. Okay, let me look up what is an industrial designer. And then I went and I started asking everyone who I knew who might know an industrial designer if they knew any industrial designers I could talk to. And eventually that led me to an industrial designer who ended up being one of my best advisors and coaches and helped connect me to the folks that ultimately became the contract manufacturers I worked with and had experience making headphones and all of these things. So there would be these conversations and not all of them are useful, but sometimes you would just get one little gem in that conversation that was like, oh, you know, they, they say that thing, you don't know what you don't know. And then someone says it and you're like, I don't know about that, but I guess I should go find it. And then you just follow the breadcrumbs and it starts to really become a picture. 
Yeah, I would say like when I had my big idea, I instantly went to the Hurt Hub and I was like, someone help me, is this a good idea? What, what should I do with that? Um, and I definitely got those little niche pockets of knowledge, so I had to go Google myself. Those golden nuggets. Yes, the little nuggets. <laughs> um, but when it came to that, there's still times when I felt like it was really hard for me to figure out exactly where I wanted to direct my product, because in my eyes it's like, help everyone, do everything, but you can't necessarily do that when you're starting a business, especially from scratch, and especially the scrappy way. So I'm wondering, what were some hard things you had, especially when prototyping and going through a whole product design? Yeah, well there's two things there. So one, I would bring it back to the thing that I said earlier about not boiling the ocean, because like I said, a lot of trap, like a trap that is very common is people kind of try to identify a very big, almost nebulous audience. And I try to push people to actually identify. So it's, if you're saying like, oh, I'm gonna sell this product to schools. And I'm like, okay, great. Who do you need to talk to at the school to sell this product to? You know, like I need you to know the exact role of the person that you are looking at and be able to go on LinkedIn and identify a handful of them that you can get a meeting with, right? Because eventually you have to get in front of these people to make the sale. And so if you can't even figure out how to get in front of them, then how are you gonna actually sell your product? So I would say that the boiling the ocean thing, being really targeted, I know that it always feels like you wanna go after the big opportunity, but you actually have to start small just to understand more of what's going on and how to effectively give them what they need and then you can scale from there. Um, the other thing I would say like to what you're bringing up as well is this kind of uh, paralysis really that can even come from thinking about all the ways and options of how you can actually approach solving the problem, right? Um, and one of the things that uh, we use as a tool um, in the boot camp that we do with black and brown founders, which is actually inspired by um, a tool that they use for kind of the blue ocean strategy, if anyone has followed any of that stuff, but it's kind of a, it's mapping those things out, right? Like I mentioned it earlier, what's the intersection between the problem that people are experiencing, your specific kind of set of skills, and what market solutions are out there right now? And there's a way that you can actually kind of put that even on a matrix and look at that according to the life cycle of whatever it is that someone is doing and identify these places where you can go and say, okay, if I'm making a necklace headphones for women, like here's the point where they're thinking about it, here's the point where they purchase it, here's the point where they start wearing it, here's the point where, you know, maybe they need to upgrade their device and like it might be the end of the life cycle and what are they gonna do with that? And then thinking about, okay, everyone who's making headphones or something that feels adjacent in that space, where are they and what are they providing and how is that working? And then where are the gaps? Those white spaces are your opportunities especially when you can match them up with, oh, I have actually a special thing that I can do that might be able to solve this problem right here. Um, and then you can jump into that space. No, I, I like that. Now I have the question of what if I'm interested and I'm in, very intrigued by the startup world and want to be an entrepreneur, but I don't have a big idea whatsoever. Like where can I fit into that space, especially on a track where I'm coming from a liberal arts college and have a variety of degrees that are maybe not lining up with tech, per se. Yes, okay, so there's two, I'm gonna answer your question, and then I wanna like bring that back to my story, which uh, I didn't dive too much into earlier. So one, I would say, start with the conversations that you are having with the people around you, right? Because I was saying the communities that you're from or have access to, and um, in those communities, like what are you complaining about? Like I would actually just, notice, like start by just noticing when you are complaining about something that is a problem and like when does it become a pattern? And ask yourself if that is a thing that you might be able to try to start solving. And again, go back to what are the unique ways in which I might be able to solve that, you know? So I think that problems, like I said, are all around us, especially in the year 2022. Like we have a lot of problems to solve as a society. <laughs> like opportunities abound. Um, so I would say that, and then I would say, you know, the way that that even applied to my experience, I'm glad that you mentioned that with the major. So as I mentioned, I majored in music in school, and I did have minors in business and Italian, and the minor in business was really like me kind of trying to like 
hopefully this is going to come into handy somehow, but I did grow up in a family business and I had some understanding of just some basic principles which helped me, but weren't necessarily the thing. I have lots of friends who are building great companies that did not grow up in entrepreneurial families. Um, but in my case, I was, I didn't even, like, I wasn't looking to start a company when I came out of college, although I wish that I had actually started experimenting while I was in college when I didn't have to, you know, worry about paying taxes and children and babysitters and all of these things. Um, I feel like it's the safest environment to fail. Uh, so definitely start experimenting right now while you're in college. Uh, but no, at that time I was just trying to figure out how was I going to get a job out of college because I really liked singing but I didn't want to make my career out of that because it's a lot of auditioning. It's a lot of, I don't, the irony of it is that you still kind of end up like in a similar situation yeah. as an entrepreneur. You get a lot of no's, a lot of rejection, a lot of pitching. But uh, at the time it was kind of like, I want a job with health insurance and a paycheck that comes every two weeks. Um, how do I do that? And it was really a similar approach where I was like, okay, I know that I love and have a deep understanding of the arts and I, eventually kind of had this epiphany of, oh, like there are, because, okay, so there was a, a, com a project that I was working on. Um, I was in the Student Government Association at the time, and I was working on a project that was trying to start an endowment to have a scholarship for students that had, because I was the diversity chair, and I wanted to create uh, a scholarship for people that were doing some compelling thing and trying to make the campus more diverse. And, um, and I started to learn about development and I started to learn about fundraising by having conversations with the university development people. And then I had this like light bulb that went off where I was just like, oh, all these like theater companies and opera people, somebody is like raising money for them to put on the plays and stuff. That's gotta be a job. And then I looked it up and I was like, it is a job. There's an internship. And then I literally applied for an internship. My first internship was at the Washington National Opera as their development intern. That's so fun. <laughs> Wish I was musically talented. I'm not. <laughs> really hope that comes up um, within your entrepreneurial world. Um, but with that, like you mentioned the job search and wanting that stability and finances and insurance and this and that. And when you hear about entrepreneurs, there's this big notion of failure at the end and rejection. The same thing you get as a college student entering the job yes. force. Yeah, it's big. Um, and I'm wondering that That's bubble real. of failure at the end, like does that... Do you think that scares you? Like, how did you approach that? Like, was that really scary for you? Or is there something else when it comes to being a business owner, um, especially as a female business owner, that is actually more scary than that failure? Yeah. Uh, my relationship with failure has been a journey. And I would say, one, I have to admit to everyone that I am a recovering perfectionist. Um, I just take it one day at a time. But <laughs> I think that perfection really cripples you when you are thinking about not having something be just right, like it has to be such and such perfect. And I brought that into, um, you know, the, the first iterations, I would say, of what we were doing with Tinsel and making the necklace headphones, where there was like a certain part of the process where even my co-founder had to come to me and she's just like, this is as good as it can be. Like we have to go into production, like you can tweak it and tweak it and tweak it and keep tweaking it. Um, but at some point you just gotta like, you know, you gotta just go. Uh, and so I think that um, that, and then I think, you know, the, the arc of that company, which was the thing that actually born the other organizations that I started, namely because I had a really hard time raising, um, you know, the subsequent money that I needed to be able to kind of get the manufacturing to the economies of scale that we needed. Hardware is, is a hard business, guys. Um, but, uh, you know, that actually kind of became both like my greatest failure and my greatest success in a way um, because the company didn't make it, but there were so many things that were born out of that and I learned so many things and I swear I left China the first time we went to the factory, like I could make anything, like I, see how this works, you know? And it was eye-opening. So I think, you know, I tell people really not to be afraid of failure. I think we all like need it a little bit to have some motivation, but not so much that you don't even like play the game, you know? Yeah, 
perfect sense. Um, my manufacturing story was the first phone call I got on. Someone told me, there's no market for neck and mole rats. You are crazy. <laughs> so I can completely relate to that. Absolutely. Maybe not so necessarily be, I can invent everything right now. <laughs> yes. Well, wait, and then here's another thing, too, is that I remember there would be, I would say, on average, I would get three no's from the manufacturer mm -hmm. before I would get a yes. So I would be like, oh, we want to, like, make the chain so that they can do this thing. And they'd be like, no, they c we can't do that. That's not possible. And I would be like, but what if you do it like this, this, and this? That's not possible. No, that's not possible. What if you do it like this, this, and that? Is that possible? No, that's not possible. What if you do it like this, this, and that? And they're like, okay, maybe if we like, and then they would kind of come back and find a way through it. So I do also, I would say that it's not even just not being afraid of failure, but being okay with hearing no, but also like knowing that sometimes no is just like, mm, well, I don't, I can't figure that out, or that creates too much work for me. And if you can solve around that problem, the no becomes a yes. So you certainly found some new skills that you were good at. Yes. Persuading those no's into, oh, we're going to change that. Exactly. For no sure. for now. But what if we do this? <laughs> so if someone like feels like they're interested in building something, but they don't have the skills to do that, what would you say in what you, what you should do or think about to determine what skills that you have that you haven't uncovered, but also those leaps of faith to take towards uncovering them? That's a great question. I think... Um, one of the things that is top of mind is uh, something else that I was saying earlier about not doing it alone and kind of starting to build up a network um, and or tap the community that you have access to because there are going to be things that, so for instance, this is a conversation that came up earlier where um, some folks might feel like they can't start a, a tech business because they are not a technical person right, that they, are, they don't know how to write code or they didn't take engineering classes or whatever. Um, also, sorry, sidebar, a trap that I also see people fall into is someone saying that like, oh, I wanna build this piece of software, so I'm going to learn how to code and then I'm going to build my app. That is a terrible idea because <laughs> you will not be as good at writing that code and building that app as someone who already has done it. So you should spend the time you were gonna spend learning how to code, finding a person who knows how to code. I'm like trying to scream it into the microphone. Find a person who has the skill that you don't have, make them your friend, sell them on the vision and bring them along. Yeah, I agree with that. So also that like power to be able to delegate and say I absolutely am horrible at this. Can you yes, do that? Yes, you're gonna write terrible code, so don't. So what are, what are some things like, I'm just wondering that you're bad at, that you have to delegate? <laughs> Ooh, that's mm -hmm. a good question. I have a lot of skills. Um, and in fact, <laughs> I'm like, I swear, I'm not trying to brag. Because it's actually, that is my, my challenge, really. Um, it's like my level up has been getting better at delegation because I feel like the trap for me has typically been, uh, like if, so one, I will like go and I can find people who don't have a thing that I need or whatever. But I would say that like my, my real challenge has been deciding not to do it myself because I know I can do it myself. Uh, and most of that is because it adds up over time. Um, and especially now where I am and I'm involved in multiple businesses, what I have learned, and I'm like, I'm going to tell you guys this for free, so maybe this will save you some time and, and pain later, is like my practice is basically to figure out the thing, spin it up, and then remove myself as quickly as possible. <laughs> um, because I, it's very easy for me to get bogged down into things, and also I'm like, I'm a creator by compulsion. Like, I'd, sometimes I'm making a thing, and I don't even realize that I am doing it until it's done, and I'm just like, oh... God, I created another company. Um, but uh, like, I, I really try to, one, use that as an opportunity to kind of bring more people into the opportunity, give people a chance, let people be leaders. Because uh, the other thing is that you just have to create really high trust teams and environments where you are gonna be okay with someone taking a completely different approach to solving a problem. If they get the results that you're looking for and they're doing it in alignment with what everyone agreed to, um, so yeah, I would say like, I, I just mostly have had to get really good at delegation and now my life kind of works a little bit more like a conductor orchestra, which is, it works. That's cool. Yeah, I think like coming into college, 
myself and many others experience that, wanting to control every aspect of life and control everything you do. And when it comes to managing others, that's hard to be able to pass off and trust someone yes. else to do it. Like, that's scary, especially when it's on your shoulders because it's your business, which I completely see. I'm wondering, are there times when you wish people, are there certain things that you wish people asked you more about your businesses mm. and what it takes to run them? I wish that people would ask me more, not necessarily about my businesses, but about business in general, um, about the way in which what capital they take is going to have an effect on what it is that they're trying to build. Um, so we actually talked about this a little bit earlier. Um, I think that there, people, specifically when we're talking about kind of the startup space, there is a very strong gravity around um, venture capital as the way that people are gonna fund those businesses. It's just kind of the, I think the brand is very strong. And people are like, I need someone else's money to help me start this company. What is there, venture capital? Because that's the thing I have heard of. Um, and there are other options, but they're much lesser known. And even in that kind of contributes to the culture of things, because if you're trying to kind of go out of the box, you need to look for a specific kind of investor who's interested in doing those things. And that's still kind of growing and cultivating. Like the headwinds are, are not insignificant. Um, but I do wish that there was continuing to like I, I want that conversation to continue because I think that people are kind of starting to wake up and realize that their business decisions are very much going to be influenced in five to ten years and like how those like year one decisions of like okay I'm going to try to find an investor who will like do x thing um, but what you're promising them in giving them a 10x return is also inevitably going to kind of be coupled with a set of decisions you're going to have to make about your business that might not really be in alignment with what you thought you were going to be doing. Um, and I'll even add to this one other thing, which is when I kind of talked earlier about this um, kind of ideal day exercise, I also really like doing that with entrepreneurs because the thing that I end up finding most of the time is that people don't actually want to build billion dollar businesses. Like they think about it in terms of like, yeah, cause that's like success and that's what we hear about in TechCrunch and all of that. But then when I like walk it back and they kind of, you know, reverse engineer the numbers and all of that kind of thing, it's like, this doesn't have to be a billion dollar business also. If your goal is to like wake up in Hawaii and have like a relaxed day where your first meeting isn't, you're probably not running a billion dollar business. Like <laughs> those two things are not compatible, right? So I think it's also really thinking about, is this actually even taking me in the direction that I set out to go? Because I have met founders who have built a company that they didn't expect to be building and it didn't actually make them happy. Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. I don't know about you all, but I feel like there is this notion of two different stereotypes for entrepreneurs. So there's the entrepreneur that you look up to that's really innovative and solving problems and out of the box thinking, but also the stereotype of someone that's really egotistic and has, is very wealthy and has this lifestyle that you couldn't even dream of because they're taking advantage of other people. Some senses may be what you're thinking. So I'm wondering, how would you approach those stereotypes when thinking about, do I really want to go in this field? Especially mm. with the venture capitalism and where yeah. you're relying on investments. I mean, I would say that, you know, this is like a larger existential question in a way, because yes. <laughs> I think that this is, to me, this is a very interesting moment in history. I think that the shakeup of everything, the destabilization of so many things, um, as I mentioned, opportunities, but I think that we are, renegotiating social contracts in real time, like in the world of kind of big business in everywhere. Like when we think about the fact that even here, I saw um, a sign on the, at the hotel that I'm staying at. There was a sign in the elevator that said that they were gonna be closed on Mondays serving from serving, like doing a food and beverage service because short staffing and whatever, whatever, right? Um, and like that's not an uncommon occurrence that's happening right now, but I think that there's something to be learned from people like not being able to hire because you are not meeting people where they need to be met. So I think that to answer your question, I feel like we're in this really interesting time where 
the things that used to very much be business as usual are being questioned, and I think that that is appropriate. Um, and we are going to have to create new agreements between business owners and business workers and like investors and entrepreneurs and you know, who am I sharing this with? Who is making decisions about this? Do I like listen to my team, even though technically I get to finally decide like if I want them to keep showing up at work every day? So, um, so I just think it's a really a exciting time. And um, I think the companies that are going to win, if I had to frame it that way, are gonna be the ones where their leaders are, are more attuned to the needs of the people that are making it possible and are at least trying to meet them where they want to be met. Yeah, that brings me to this next question, which I just came out of nowhere, because I think it's applicable in daily life and with my friends and my family, but also as a business owner and employees, how do you celebrate those passions and talents of your coworkers and your employees and people that you're seeing in your daily life, especially now that that line between work life and home life is blurred with everything remote? I'm just wondering, yeah, how yeah. do you put that in? You got the good questions. Okay, so there's a lot to that too. I will say this, both in terms of businesses that I'm running and also in terms of businesses that are in the portfolio that I manage, and even when I just talk to friends, like everyone is feeling really burnt out and crispy. Like we've been... I don't even want to know what you would call the state that we've been in for the past few years, but it's been intense. Um, especially if you've got, you know, other people you have to take care of, whether it be kids, parents, I mean, animals. Um, and I think that everyone is just trying to figure out how to keep showing up every day. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's, I think there have been a lot of really interesting and open conversations about that and how we can kind of create space for people to rest. Um, and I think that it's been really interesting because what conversations look like when I feel like you're at an organization that has leadership that's really invested and interested in trying to do right by as many people as possible is a willingness to actually slow down the roadmap a little bit because people, like maybe we're gonna just like close the office for this week and like no one is working. Everybody shut down your email, do not open your laptop for seven days, and then we're gonna come back to this and we're gonna try again, you know? And I think that those kinds of things are both ones that kind of bring humanity into the world and into the business. I think it kind of models and shows that we can still be productive and even be high performing, but we wanna make space for people to rest. And I just think, so I feel like there's so many things that are, that are built into that, yeah. yeah. That in itself is an innovation of its own. Just saying, oh, we're gonna close everything and everyone's gonna take a break because we have to or because we need to. Yeah, and I mean, I think a real sign of it too is just how shocked people are when they hear people who are technically in charge like say that, where they're just like, wait, for real? <laughs> is this a trick? <laughs> no, exactly. Am I still gonna get paid? <laughs> okay, I'm in. <laughs> well, like as a person that's in charge and like being the owner of a business and an entire company, like that would be really surprising. <laughs> so I'm like, me? You, you want me to not come? Yeah. Um, that's awesome. As in being in that position of power and like you do have employees, but individuals that are asking to know more about your company, what you're doing and your mission and purpose behind it. Are there things that you wish people would ask more or things that you're tired of the masking? Sorry, reverse. Mm. Tired of the masking. Mm because of the perception around maybe what it's like to be uh, a This owner. might be a hot take, but I'm, I would say, um, it, again, it comes back to the capital thing, but I would say that like people asking how they get capital before they have figured out how their thing is gonna make money. And I think um, it's a really common scenario also in the world of startups where I would argue that fundraising becomes their business model. Um, and that just isn't going to sustain long term. Like eventually your business has to have customers. You need to have enough to keep the business afloat, all of those things. Um, and so I think that just all the conversation, all the glamour uh, around being seen as like people see it as validation to say that they have investors in their business. And I mean, in terms of social cues, that is how we treat it. But 
I'm like, I'm not impressed with your investors. I'm impressed with your, like, how much money are you making? <laughs> Have you figured out how to make money? I am not impressed. <laughs> yeah. So just wondering, how much does money actually matter in life, in your opinion? Ooh. You know, um, <laughs> you know a, a decent bit, but <laughs> I would argue that it's not the most important thing. I think, um, I think that love and human connection are the most important things. Uh, there was this... Um, this Twitter thread, actually, that I was going on this weekend, um, where I, I had just been having a lot of conversations in recent, like, events and rooms that I've been in, mm -hmm. where this thing about, especially just given our current moment in time, uh, asking, are humans inherently good or evil, you know? Um, like, are we innately born one way or the other? And... I used to think of it that way too, but I feel like I've shifted my thinking on that in terms of, um, you know, it's just not the right framing because I think that humans aren't born either way. I think that humans are born with an inherent need to be loved and like once they learn how to like give love and I think that human connection is really at the basis of what motivates us to do almost anything. Um, and to me, like, money is just something that can help with access to connections and relationships. And obviously, we all need to, like, put food on our tables and keep roofs over our heads and things like that, like, once we get older. But I think it really does start with love and connection because there are people who have lots of money and are not, not doing very well. <laughs> well, that brings me to our final question because we're running out of time. Um, Ania, do you really love your job? Do I love my yeah, job? Yeah, do you love your job? <laughs> I do. I do. Um, I feel immensely grateful uh, because I have many jobs, but now the main job uh, at Omidyar Network is giving me the opportunity to be the funder that I always wish that I had. Um, I feel like the, the dynamics between kind of investor and, you know, investee, <laughs> Uh, like are just charged with all these really interesting power dynamics that can go sideways like very, very easily. Um, and there is actually a conversation that's happening in philanthropy right now um, and the conversations that I have with other funders that are in the space and other kind of program officers where they're trying to figure out how they can build better relationships with the people that they have been funding. And I think that, you know, traditionally we've taken this very kind of paternalistic lens and sort of been like, well, I have money and there is a problem and I'm going to come save all these people. Um, and the thing is that they haven't asked us to save them. They just asked us to empower them to actually save themselves. And so there's just like a very different kind of model and way of working that's happening on the other side of the, the table too. And it's a really exciting time to kind of come in with a lens of someone who's been out there in the trenches trying to build something and try to like also watch and observe on the inside like how these things end up playing out so that the kind of grantees and the people that you're working with end up having these really poor experiences. Um, and so I just, like, I love trying to kind of build these bridges together, and I get to do that. And now I also get to show up with resources with people who are, like, committed to trying to collectively move forward together. Like, people really want to be swimming in the same direction, and there are all these things that get in the way, and I feel like being able to kind of name those things and ask people to look inward at examining that has just been this really fun and interesting like social experiment that I get to be part of every day and I really like it. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> so much to think about just on the daily. Yeah, exactly. Well, if you're a student that is at all interested in entrepreneurship or learning more, I would completely suggest you get up and walk across the street to the Hurt Hub or visit them online on their website. Uh, I just want to thank you again, Ania, for coming here and giving this wonderful chat. Thank you, Carson. And having this conversation with me. And thank you for everyone here and at home who have tuned in for this evening. Thanks. Thank you.